on theory, which I used to do. So um, I think, as uh, many of the people said here, I should really thank my students for carrying this work. And this, basically, we're talking about three or four papers. Four or five students have really made major contributions, and Jamie's here. The rest are not, so ask him for the hard question on the second part. The first leads uh, for the first project are not here. So here we've been trying to do science and interpretation, right? The EU GDPR 2016 gives right to explanation. So um, and near where I am, and these other projects really all need interpretation. So I was at an IPAN workshop in May. Do you want to switch to the full screen? Oh, good point. Thank you. So there was a startup uh, co-founder who was using deep learning for radiology, and she said that FDA wants her to interpret her algorithms. So it's really coming to a lot of regulation, especially come to precision medicine, where the stack is much higher than make, losing some money and losing a few customers, right? It's people's life on stake. So this mission critical applications of deep learning and it really needs us to be very careful. And interoperability interpretation can really help us to be more trustworthy. And my own group, we have been working on genomics, and we really want to help scientists to design experiments to find genes in the right interaction form so that they can do experiments. And also, we've been trying to work with a neuroscientists, try to do neuroscience. And this is the first project I'll talk about later. Can we characterize neurons in a way that physiologists have been doing and use deep learning? And the last one, Jamie was very much engaged, or was the drivers that um, we want to interpret to a generic kind of deep learning interpretation with some hierarchical structure. And as I said, you say we, my group do, um, we do machine learning for science, and there's a new name I like quite a lot called scientific machine learning. So let me try to define scientific machine learning. It uses machine learning for scientific research to track information for discovery and knowledge. And also try to build scientific principles in machine learning algorithms. I was at Flight Iron a couple months ago. People try to build in physics principles into deep learning. So it's both ways. And you want to uh, iterate. And the results are subject to scientific standards. For me, particularly, it's Jia Galant, my co uh, colleague in neuroscience. His standard, I will have to say that it's very high, especially on writing. When I complain about paper, we have worked with him for five years, hasn't been written, he said. We have written papers over six years. So the time scale is much longer. And if you assume the IQs in the two fields are equal, the papers are much better written. And it's much easier for us to build on each other's work. So that's what I like. And we have different people in my group try to do interoperability, genomics, natural language processing, and also deep like a neuroscience. When we really um, got up together to do this paper, try to define really what we mean by interpermission learning. And Jamie and Chandon, the first two also really drove the project, and with some help from the rest of us. So we defined interpermission learning. We decided we cannot deal with general interoperability. There you have to go to philosophy, you go to psychology, you go to linguistics. It's not something we feel like we can handle, or anybody. So we define interpretive machine learning as the extraction of relevant information from a machine learning model concerning relationships, either contained in data or learned by the model. And we emphasize that we have to have an audience to really even define interoperability and a chosen problem. And there's actions to follow with communication and discovery. So in one easier um, graph, we have a problem. Say we wanted radiology for some um, medical images. And we have a group of people, say doctors, who we really want this interoperability. And for patients, that's a different interoperability bar. And we want to use predictability as, or accuracy as a way to say the model has to capture things in the data. You don't want to interpret things that has nothing to do with data. And also, you have to have descriptive accuracy. And you can try to do descriptive accuracy based on interoperability on the model or after the model is fitted. And you need relevancy for both the uh, predicted accuracy model based interoperability and uh, the ad hoc an analysis to the problem you're trying to solve. 
So this is just a more extended version. In the interest of time, I just point out that for prediction accuracy, you have global for the whole average. You should also look at the prediction based for each data point. And the usually there's a trade-off, not always, right? We like to think that decision trees, but if you think about actually decision trees with relatively shallow are interpretable. When you have decision with a depth of thousand, I don't think that's really interpretable anymore. And logistic regression or linear models, again, you can now do with a million terms in logistic regression. So it's relatively small things we think that are pretty descriptive. And random forest, because it has some decision trees, and that's what we like in genomic work. We haven't seen in my group deep learning beats random forest in terms of interpretability and results. And also deep learning, it's, it's probably on another scale. And if you have a model, when you try to fit the model, we, if you can get the same prediction accuracy, you like sparsity, which most of us will agree. And also something we added, I think it's very interesting, is similability. It's like, can, how can you let a human to really simulate the process of decision? So for shallow trees, I talked to a doctor, emergency room doctor. He said he remembered about 10 decision rules when he's working as an emergency room doctor, which is decide whether the case is emergency. And modularity, do you have parts you can take that relatively simplify things. And also you have something like credit score in banking that domain-based feature engineering. And then you can use machine learning statistical method to come up with feature later may become part of the knowledge. And that's about the model. And also maybe you cannot do any of that like deep learning. You have to really rely on other methods. People cook up with like importance measures for interactions, tested scores, and visualization. And also you uh, can look at local interruptions and alternatives. That's what I'll be talking about, which are the alternatives. So both for the rest of the talk, we'll be talking about two particular projects. And the first is kind of doing global predictability and later to look at individual ones. Actually, it's both for the first project. Both are post hoc interpretations and relate to deep learning. Here, here um, fits the theme of the workshop. And the second one is a, a general method called agglomerative contextual decomposition, which is built contextual decomposition. Jamie did when he was started at, um, he was doing a Google Brain um, intern. So the first project has been going on at least three years, possibly four if I count right. So it's a project we've been really uh, got the good predictive results very early on, like three years ago. I've been struggling with the interpretability question for science. And it's led by Reza and Yuan Si, the two first authors from my group, and it's with Jay Galan's lab on campus, whom I have been working for the last uh, 15 years. And Adam is in Google now, in Boulder. Mike is at Allen Institute, and Ben Wilmo is Oxford. Reza has returned to UCSF as faculty, and Yuan Si joining Duke as a faculty. So the approach we take in my group for scientific machine learning, actually we embed our students on site, so they go to group meetings, which we, pre we try to become a scientist, if anything, that's what we like to do. And we take a scientific problem and we generalize. When we solve a particular problem, so my approach, I mean, I came from a pretty theoretical background 30 years ago, so some of the older people I knew from my last round of theory work in the 90s. And then we generalize. So, so the, the philosophy here is, let's solve a problem, at least solve one problem. And then I think you have more power to generalize to other problems. I definitely, over my career, I pay a lot more attention to empirical evidence, and not just simulation. And simulation can be used for its well design, but it's more in the trenches to see something really work. And then I really want to do theory now. That's why I want, we're coming back to more theory. And so a comment on this uh, L2 ball, the talks I heard earlier, I think it's a very good start. But the next thing I think will be the next important step is actually find a real problem that type of uh, perturbation will solve. And maybe it will give you input to revise the model and to get to do the next round of theory. I think that will be a healthy cycle. So here we have this very uh, difficult elusive area of visual cortex, primary visual cortex called V4. So V1 is like a ball edge detectors. And we have this fo feed forward network, the real biological network. And when well, we have deep learning network, right? And if you ask a biologist, at least a couple of years ago, they didn't think deep learning really captured anything because it's not biological. 
And this V1, V2, V4, it's one of the major visual pathways. It tries to send information about what we are looking at. There's also a wear pathway. And V4 has been very, very hard for years to figure out what it does. So the, the scientific kind of input we get from this field is really say, how do scientists capture or characterize a neuron? And this is um, a video called Internet, like the Nobel Prize winning work by Hubble and Weasel in the late 50s to figure out V1. It's kind of first layer of deep learning. You reproduce that with large data. It's just orientation, selectivity for orientation, location, and uh, so what you're hearing is the firing of a particular V1 neuron, and what the cat is looking at is on the screen. You can see that when you find the right location, in terms of causality, induce a causal reaction. So this is basically proof that V1 neuron care about location. V4 is a very different story. So I don't know, I didn't do the history on how uh, Hubble and Weasel figured out. With that data, we could have all gotten a Nobel Prize, right? It's like, how did they get there to figure out these are the stimuli to let the sleepy cat to look at? So V4 has been very elusive because people, at least for the last 20 years, have been doing very geometric um, composition of stimuli and see whether V4 neuron gets excited. So anatomically, they figured out this is the V4 region, but they don't know what it does. So they come up with these different shapes, very geometric. So if you're lucky, you get it. If you're not, you, you have to design something else. So that's why we hope to help. And people also do this, all this curvature, right? You can see it's very detailed about, and then try it and to see whether V4 neuron gets excited. It's very, very inefficient to figure out how neuron works. So Jack's life is always into uh, natural language and uh, not natural stimuli. I mean, 20, 15 years ago when I was work, started working with him, it was kind of not quite accepted. Now I think the field really accepted we should use natural stimuli to stimulate the brain instead of these very um, geometric shapes. So the data was collected by Ben Wilma, who is now in Oxford. It took him two years. So this is all very expensive data. Work with a primate um, to get the data. So you get the um, primate. Uh, macaque to fixate at the center of the screen. And then with all kinds of rewards, and you've shown things, random selected from this old database of black and white, and see the, one of the VIFO neurons we excite, and you try to do more. So we have been on this track since 2013 with Julian Mera, Yuval Benjamini. We did our first work, got the state of our prediction performance. What do we mean by state of the art? We compare with V2, which is an easier visual cortex. So if we meet the prediction performance, we declare a success. That's what we mean by state of the art. So we used basically two layer direction, uh, dictionary learning with some shift uh, features, and also with the orientation, and we got the best result. And parallels, um, the color group at MIT have been very similar part. They more care about IT, but now doing also V4. So they have a little different, not exactly natural images. They have some in the beginning, and now they also use natural images. So we've been on this parallel path. Of um, They have published their predictive work, and we have been wanting to do interpretation. So um, I'll come back to how our work compare right now. So for us, actually, we kept kind of replicating um, De Carlo's work and for scientific scientists in training actually were quite happy to be on par with the top lab. Yes, Alex. So when you say you are doing predictions, so what exactly are you predicting? I it's the single, I will show you, it's the uh, average uh, firing rate of a single neuron. Thank you for the question. So each neuron you observe uh, with these random selected images, a firing rate. And for the test data, we have 10 replicates, so it's a better uh, firing rate estimation than the training. So two questions we said like five years ago want to do is how do we characterize V4 neurons? Remember, we in the same traditional physiology, we want to find stimuli that excite, make the neuron fire. That's basically define what we mean by uh, characterize neuron. And if we could do that, we can find these images from data, hopefully more natural than these geometric shapes. We can also feed back to the closed loop experiments and increase the efficiency of neuroscience experiments. And also, as somebody in the middle of machine learning and science, we also want to help answer this question that do convolutional net neural networks really resemble brain at all? Right. It's just 
I'm kind of in the middle try to interface the two. And so that's why we first want to remember two layer dictionary learning. And I think three years ago, I was giving a talk and um, Joshua Benjo was speaking after me. He was doing deep learning already. And looked like I made out my own, our own deep learning network based with our small data. So we decided to try deep learning. That's why I got into deep learning. and actually worked pretty well. So let me tell you exactly what we did. So we basically did transfer learning. We just took people trained AlexNet and did some simple regression to connect with the neural firing rate. And then we end up quickly with 18 models with very similar prediction. That's why we struggled with interpretation for three years. I'll show you what we end up with. And I have to say that I was very surprised how the ImageNet deep learning as a feature extraction worked really well for our McCaig data. So that's what we have heard a lot about ImageNet. And other people trained it, right? We didn't for classifications of a thousand classes. So what we did, we have black and white. We just took the first two layers as feature extraction. No change, nothing about the McCaig. And we just made three channels, black, white, into color. We didn't alter anything to tailor to. And then we did regression, Ridge and Lasso. And we did slightly better than our handmade deep learning network. So basically saying that one conjecture is that this early layer of deep learning, a kind of universally captures some structure about primate cortex. Right? This is, you see, why is transfer learning? You have color image to black and white. Our image had nothing to do with the image net. And you have very high level task to very micro level neuron responses. But we do need some lasso to match. So in that sense, you transfer color of black and white from human to macaque and from high level task to low level neuron responses. And actually not just layer two. We did layer two. Many layers work. And then the question is, suppose we take, I'll come back to the many layer and many uh, network issue. So suppose you want to look at a particular model feed. We did this is from a model, Equinex plus Lasso or Ridge. How do you describe your model, like post hoc uh, analysis? If you remember how I started with physiology, they want to find images to excite a neuron. So here I have a model neuron. It's a deep learning plus regression. And if we maximize this model neuron, somehow, I'm trying to say these are the predicted patterns this neuron will care about. Okay. And we didn't do exactly the model because too rough. We did some regularization about smoothing of the image to kind of constrain the search space a bit smooth than just any possible. And that's what we got. So one conjecture is that actually this neuron-like curvature, right? Remember we know we uh, found neuron like curvature with all these various geometric shapes of different uh, curvature. And we also did compression. That's why I come back to the complexity question. That's why counting the number of weights is not a good idea. You can easily compress it by 50%. You still see. It. So this is a perturbation by removing filters and reduce by 50%. And you still see this curvature. So we try to find different ways to convince that this is a curvature neuron. And then you look at all the images, we have a much smaller database, right? So we look at the database and pick these images that excite the model neuron. It's the model. And you see curvature again. But you don't see this stripe, these periodic stripes. And that's model based. So we look at the raw test data. This has no model. We look at the peak, you also see some curvature. So all of this try to confirm that the curvature we saw from the deep tune, which is really a derivative of a deep dream, that seemed to capture something. And then there are a lot of other models, VGG and GoogleNet, and they give very similar prediction performance, like correlation 0.92. And you have Lasso, you have Ridge, again, you have very similar performance. So quickly, and not just layer two, you have layer three, layer four, we end up with 18 models. Okay, very similar performance. So this is uh, um, the model hacking, right? Those, most people, you, you do cherry picking, but we like to be um, transparent and report all of that. So the question, how can we come up with the interpretation that reflect all 18 models from the evidence, they all do well in terms of prediction. 
So that's where the stability comes in. So I mean, the right day, definitely. So at least for the last five, six years, I've been advocating and my group to, for stability as a basic principle for data science and try to integrate different data algorithm perturbations and as a minimum requirement for interoperability, reproducibility, and scientific hypothesis generation. So you can call it robust. This is the reason I did it. It's because robust statistics means something different, but now I'm just putting everything all in variance. So I said that we have 18 models. If you do this, actually random initialization doesn't change things visually too much. But if you change different models, different layers, you do see different, you see curvature. But they're different, right? Google Net has a lot of the eye-like things you also see in Deep Dream. And Alex and I seem to have bigger intervals between the curves, and Google Net has smaller ones. And, but we all agree you see some curvature there. And for a while, I was giving talk, I've been giving this talk versions of it for the last couple of years. And last year, I was at a workshop at Banff, and people were not happy with this 18 images. They said they want one. So we went back to the drawing table and uh, uh, Yuan Si and Reza came up with this great idea of introduce stability at the gradient level, right? So we're basically doing gradient ascent on the fitted model for each individual deep tune images. But if we combine the ATM model at the algorithm level, and we're going to work to the model with the smallest gradient at the particular point, and you get what we call consensus smooth deep tune images. You do that, these are 10 such images from 10 different random initializations. So you see a lot more consistency than the 18 models, which actually I was quite happy with for a while. And that's what we end up with when we submitted the paper. Is there any theoretical support for this? <coughs> this is empirical. Do you have any theoretical conjecture of why? So, um, I'm pretty empirical this is. So what I want to see is that to have a close up, ex a close loop experiment and just feed it in and see things work. And it's, uh, the theoretical analysis is kind of, is how do you formulate a scientific interpretation question to a mathematical framework? I think that's very challenging. But you can maybe take bits of it. So one of my posts, Dominic said that he can, you know, for the general stability principle, he can show that has, has a really good, um, like, um, we have negative results on stability, theoretical negative results on stability in, in a different domain. Yeah, maybe I'll talk to you about it. Yeah, so right now it's, it's empirical. As I said, we are very empirical these days, and we're coming back to theory uh, as we speak. For your, for your AT model, do you need to guarantee that the filter size is, is the same for all the different models? Or? So, so remember, I, I take three different um, VGG, Google Knight, and so they have the same filter size. And then for each of the three, I took uh, three layers. So for the, and the other nine come because of Ridge and uh, Lasso. So about six of them share the same filter size. Yeah. And they're different pieces, a little different. Yes. Um, so the, my experience with Deep Dream is that it loves to bring out patterns that are, you know, kind of nice to look at. I wonder, I'm curious if you've done, found uh, any neuron that doesn't respond to anything. So if you do this, then it's just black image. You mean the real neuron or um, oh, model neuron? Yeah, your, your neuron. Yeah, we usually get patterns, <laughs> but we don't look at those things when the prediction accuracy is pretty bad. So we concentrate on the ones which we predict pretty well. And then you see patterns. Even for the bad one, you see patterns, but we don't trust them. But we do do smoothing, right? So we have some um, like nearby pixel smoothing as a regularization to the optimization. So yeah. this is, that's why I call this hypothesis generation. And to struggle with something that uh, we're happy with as a team. So then we see consensus images with good neurons. That means they have, I think, over 0.5. And then you can now cluster them. You recover a lot of the behavior which people know already, which is this uh, very uh, geometric design for the stimuli. People know there's texture, there's also curvature, there's more complex pattern. I also see things like this. This is really like a Gabal filter, but has much bigger receptive field. 
So it makes sense that people know that in V1, in V4, you also have kind of V1-like edge detectors. So it's a bigger receptive field. That means the neuron carries a bigger region of the image than a small one as V1, like a ball. And then we send the paper out. And I think one of the people who really know this style had really uh, very helpful reviews. It's really questioning which part of the image in deep tune is really capturing the neuron, which are artifacts of the model. So we define to decompose it into smaller bits. And you see a compounding effect because the, the convolutional filters compound the result. They do the invariance, so you have a higher, higher responses because the different curves got on top of each other after the convolution layer. And you see the same thing for some uh, texture layer too. We also decompose it into just different pieces. You see each has some reaction, but you do see a compound behavior when you have the whole image. And if you go back to this, you can see that this period is much, much smaller than this. We believe this is an artifact of the size of the convolutional filter. So you cannot really interpret the whole thing entirely. It's more locally, we think it might be more interpretable. So this drive, because we don't believe the whole picture is really driven by the neuron, but it's because the artifact of the model. We're going to try to do almost like data uh, argumentation. You basically randomly uh, permute the small parts of it uh, as input to the closed loop experiment. So as I said, we have been on the same track at the Carlos group. They actually just published a paper. They beat us because uh, Jack, my collaborator, he stopped doing physiology experiments. So that's why we didn't have any access. And students have to graduate. So, uh, so, but we're pretty pleased that they basically had their version of this very similar idea published in science to show that you can use this to design closed loop experiments. And so as scientists in training, I'm pretty happy we're kind of on the same track as a top lab instead of getting disappointed. Uh, and if I bring back the uh, PDR angle, predictive accuracy, discrete accuracy, and relevance, you can see that um, we have state-of-the-art prediction performance on the test data. And we have sparsity at last layer if you take the lasso model or you do thresholding at the ridge. We have modularity because of different units. And the first layer, Gabor, because we use the future expression, it's very interpretable. And because scientists really believe that the first layer is like a Gabor. And relevancy, we think that it's relevant to computational neuroscientists. So right now, we're actually rewriting the paper. Jack is going uh, through the paper with my students line by line. Because Jack's goal is to write a paper so that 100 years from now, people can still read it. <laughs> and he really um, has very high writing standards. So I'm learning, too. I don't know how to write a scientific paper, to be honest. And my students are being trained. And he's really sitting down going line by line. And um, so I think if you want something good, I think it usually takes hard work. That's my belief. So maybe neuroscience you'll find interesting. And maybe the deep learning community, that's why I'm giving a talk, find this interesting as well. And the closed loop experiments will be very important next steps. So actually, this deep tune is a special case of a general framework my group has been working on and has been advocating, or called PCS workflow. It's really try to build some statistical ideas in an expanded way on top of machine learning. So in the beginning, I was working with Jack like 15 years ago. So we're just doing machine learning, doing prediction. And now I want to do experiments and also to interpret. So that's why we introduce this stability idea as an idea from uncertainty. I mean, statistically, if you look at uncertainty measure in statistics, it's really about perturbation, which is another data set from the same distribution. But if you look at the whole data science life cycle, you have problem formulation, you have a linguistic stability issue when you have multiple teams of people from different areas. Do they understand the English language or another language in the same way? And data perturbation was advocated in my 2013 paper. And I go back to Tukey, because it was actually a Tukey lecture, and use a modern fancy term. Actually, I would say that Tukey made an adversarial attack on sample mean in the 50s. Right? He basically added the outlier to show that the sample mean is not stable. And then the whole field of robust statistics became uh, a subfield when people consider outliers, influence functions, some of that idea have been also brought back to deep learning interpretation. 
And this PCS framework really require a documentation. So that's the goal is really bring some liberal art thinking into data science and data work. To really argue, as I think discussed earlier, what's the right perturbation for a particular problem? For theory, I can see you have constraints. You might have only to do for Gaussian. But maybe you can argument it with some thoughtful simulation. Maybe you do Laplacian, you do something else, and maybe you go to low dimension and do the perturbation. Because not all the perturbation is equally likely. On that note, I was thinking in the first talk was actually, you need, for, for the framing I saw, was really about if you know the kind of attack, you can do certification. But in real wild, the adversary is not going to tell you how they're going to attack you. So maybe some game strategic point of view will be helpful here to really have a random strategy to really uh, certify your algorithm. So the adversary actually doesn't know what you're going to use. So you play this game. And you have probably in wild, I think, would be a lot more I will bet on that than with this L2 perturbed certified uh, results. I mean, certification is very um, uh, assuring, but there are conditions. So that's the thing. People keep saying, I want guarantees. But without saying what conditions you have the guarantees under, you really cannot apply that to practice. Because if the conditions never met in practice, your guarantees are not relevant. So in terms of data perturbation, right, you have this typical perturbation in the IID setting, bootstrap subsampling, and adding small to noise. Uh, now it's called data argumentation in this community. Actually, Leo Bryman was advocating in the 90s. And institutions will also have, you take residuals, and then you add noise to it. And not just data argumentation through noise. You can also run mechanistic models. Like I think Peter Abuse Group actually do some PD-driven robust arm uh, reaching to an object. And you can put that in also. So this PCS form try to incorporate all of that. And adversarial perturbations has been existing at least since the crash in banking. It's called stress, stress testing. Right? You want to ch change things so that the bank will have enough reserve so that it won't go bankrupt. So a lot of these concepts have been existed. And the one related to Alexander is actually, I think he was talking about robust features. It's really he's kind of getting at causality through invariance. So that's what I was also getting at through the uh, hypothesis generation. So you have causality implies predictability. When you add stability or robustness, you have a stronger case for interpretability and also causality. And there's a line of work people since the 40s from economics that people have been using uh, invariance to seek uh, causality. So causality, if you have causality, is a very strong form of interpretability. So back to computability in deep tune, that you have basically gradient base, right? We didn't train the model. We trained the lasso and ridge end of it, gradient descent, and deep tune is a gradient ascent or descent, depending on how you look at it. So this is the first one, very much embedded in a scientific community, try to do science with a scientific collaborator. And the second project, I would say that it's more machine learning in the sense that we want a generic way of interpreting deep learning models, and especially for case by case, not just for the average model. And can we visualize in an Anderson way for human consumption? So all of these are the post hoc interpretation. People have used gradient-based methods. And we'll compare with the one which is um, more used and computation more physical, the IG, integrated gradients. And there's also contribution base. Basically, you remove a certain part of the image or zero it out and see how the prediction accuracy change. So this idea is related to Leo Bryman's idea in the importance measure in, um, in random forest. He didn't remove it. He actually scrambled up, kept the marginal ex um, distribution. So you could, in theory, also do that and just take a random pixel in there and then see how things change. Mm -hmm. And we'll compare with the occlusion or saliency map, which is also one of the more uh, useful ones. So this is very much Jamie's work. Um, that he started with the um, LSTM for sentiment analysis. And you have a movie, and the LSTM is going to spill up a positive sentiment. And we hope to have also explanation. Uh, that will be 
question why the movie was viewed as positive. And there were already important scores, but language is not just random ensemble of words. There are relationships. There is compositionality of the words that make a meaning. So you have two, if you have only two important scores for not and good, there's no way you can describe the not good. You, have, you need three pieces of information. Just not enough. So you have to go beyond word importance. And Jimmy, I think, was working with Peter at Google Brain and came back. I kind of helped a bit after he came back that he was really going after something that you can do all three, right? You can easily get out from a LT, LSTM prediction. Again, faded, the weights were not fading. And you decompose it right into a soft max in the last end, you're doing classification into two terms. The first term corresponds to a particular phrase, which can be one word, two words, three, or any. And then you write the other parts into the other parts. And we're going to try to interpret the gamma t. So this is, and recently that was our Claire 2018 paper. Chandon and Jamie, they follow up on that and did a agglomerative contextual decomposition and so also generalized to the uh, convolution network for images. So in short, ACD is a hierarchical classing algorithm with visualization by using the CD scores because we have CD scores for not just one word but also for phrases and we also have a very nice visualization for that. So if I put the ACD through the lens of PDR in terms of interval machine learning, we're not changing the predictive accuracy because we're taking already fitted model. And descriptive accuracy allows for description in terms of any sub of the feature space and for some of them we also visualize. And the relevancy is really to machine learners. Um, developer, maybe you can identify by. So going back, like why? So it'll be interesting to try some of these flying peak examples to see where our uh, importance measure will give suggestions. That's why some of the, are you really taking out, to use the term of Alex, like robust features or non-robust features? <coughs> so this is uh, both ways, validate, understand, hopefully this uh, robust methods, and also try to validate what we do, whether it makes sense. So people have tried that. Uh -huh. That interpretability methods are easily fooled by visual examples as well. Really? So if you give me an interpretability metric, then I can introduce a perturbation that fools the classifier and the interpretability metric at the same time. So what one did they try? Did they try this particular one? Or? Probably not this exact one, but every great, I mean, every one that I've seen, people have been able to fool. If you it was super one, simple, gradient based. It. Yeah, it's Amirata's work in, at Stanford, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. There are lots of them that do this. In yeah. general, you give me an arbitrary interpretability metric, I can make you do the wrong thing. Yeah. Well, you can defend the interpretation using the like, sneaking methods. Uh, sure, you can try and add a defense to an interpretability metric, but in some sense, is defeating the purpose of the interpretability metric. The I mean, interpretability metric is trying to say that we can, in general, tell me why a prediction was made some way. And if I have to defend that against attack, it's probably not doing the right thing to begin with. I mean, you can you know, design robust interpretation methods. Yes, if you try and design one, but as soon as you say, well, I'm going to do smoothing and PGD adversarial training to protect my interpretability metric against adversarial attacks, this is self-defeating in some sense. I think you might be right, but uh, I'd like to try it and then see what happens. Because I think it's a little different the way we collected the information. Jamie, do you want to add? I'll just say that a lot of the interpretation techniques out there kind of suck right now. And so the fact that you know, you're able to make, that you're able to show another way that they suck is not all that shocking to me. Um, I think that what we've done doesn't suck. Uh, and <laughs> so it would be, and it would so be interesting then to try and run PGD on this. And I would put, I don't know, 101 odds that it fails in the same way. Sorry? We should, I think we should fail. <laughs> I, I'd be willing to bet that, that if you run PGD on this, it will fail yeah. in exactly the same way everything else has failed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would. Sure. Okay, um. okay so let me finish before you guys can um, debate it out after the talk. I, I'm agnostic. I want to see evidence and I'll believe. Yeah. So this is, I uh, have only two minutes. So. Um, this is with this hierarchical um, interpretation. You can see that 
we have this scale, this is positive, this is negative, this is more positive, this is neutral, this is slightly positive, and put it together, you can get the whole sentence being negative. A uh, more sophisticated way of a sentence is a similar thing. You can really combine the strengths of the context and put it together to see how the sentiment uh, direction changed. You can do the same for um, images. That, so we have these different classifications. You can see that if you look at the class of Puck, then this identifies that the skates are also responsible to help to see this a Puck, right? Because they, in real life, they are pretty correlated. So you do pick this up. This just highlights the important features for this particular prediction algorithm. But I think like everything, you can be fooled, so we should try the adversarial text. And we did a small human experiment with 11 graduate students from STATS and EECS at Berkeley. And you can see the first one is that we give them a good model and bad model. The bad model is made by random perturbing some of the weights in a good model with the same class label and ask them uh, which one is a good model. So if they find a good model through the interpretation, they're only giving the interpretation, then we said that they got it right. So you can see that the ACD does better than our own method and also integral gradient and occlusion. And this is another data that to ask people ranking um, the different interpretations, whether they're trustworthy or not. You can see that uh, ACD, but this is a very small experiment. And, but, um, so to finish, so we've been, my group has been really going after interpretation in various projects, and it's particularly in scientific uh, machine learning. And we hope to help bias identification and also this general prediction Computability and stability, I think, is a general framework we're building up and also going to inference. We have something called perturbation intervals, which is a generalization of confidence intervals. One, you don't have the probability model in trust which you can still talk about perturbation intervals. And we try to lay out a few landmarks on what we mean by interval machine learning. And we actually collected a lot of examples in the paper, other people's work, and put into this framing. Talked about two particular projects for interpretability in neuroscience and also in general. So actually preparing for this talk, as I realized, we should try to analyze our deep tune images through ACD, but there's some people are not in Berkeley anymore. Things have been slow, so I don't have anything to show you. And we also try to translate these papers uh, into like social science and also medicine, like this general framework. And thank you. Last not least, I'm working on a book with my student, Rebecca Butter. And hopefully try to help people to really get into, so where we really try to build the, the link between reality and the algorithm. So there's always a quantum leap. And a lot of the textbooks I did that for 20 or 30 years start with X, right? My first lecture was asking where the X come from. So this book attempt to fill that gap. So I think that's a weak link. It's not algorithms and mathematics not important, but it's a very important link, which in the education system we don't talk about. So that's what this book is about. And Baker did this beautiful poster for a talk she will give next week. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Uh, so I like that you ran the human experiments at the last the last slide, but I typically see the trust issue separate from the interpretability, where interpretability method, in my opinion, should show when you shouldn't trust the model. So I'm curious to see where you come from when you measure both interpretability and uh, the trust as a measure of interpretability. We did two, right? The first one is try to differentiate good and bad model, right? So bad model is kind of a stand-in for a not trustworthy thing, right? So we give them like a, a comparison. And the second one is something in practice people don't always have the luxury of having a bad model to compare with. Because humans are very good at comparing things. In absolute scale, we're not very good. So the second one, Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong, that is try to go for direct like people look at it. Well, so if you actually, the NLP example we have is a great example. Can you, can you go back like five slides to the NLP slide? This one? Uh, no. Yeah, that one. So that's a great example of when you shouldn't trust the model, because that's actually an incorrect prediction that the model's made. Uh, but if you look through the logic there, 
you can see that it's up until the last two phrases, it's actually got everything right. It even captures the negation of uh, you know, not let this heart fail enterprise out of the meter. Uh, so the, but the, it's in the last step where it goes to string. I see. So the point of that graph, two graphs, is that actually that if it's a bad model, there's less trust. And it's like a correlation. I'm more curious about like your sort of maybe philosophical background behind it. Because I try hard to like separate those two because if the trust is your goal, then you can just look at psychology to see how do we deceive people. Because people are very easy to deceive. But you also have multiple multiple goals, right? You don't always have only one goal when people look at models. A lot of things go through people's minds. So I think actually looking at this interoperability from multiple angles will be useful. Right. Um, so if the neuroscience project I'm more engaged with is that it's going to be a long, drawn-out process before anything what we do are accepted by the community. So we're glad to have the Carlos group doing with us. And he actually, we visited him, and we had a back and forth discussion. He actually didn't, he wanted everything to be automated. So we tried to become like a physiologist to use visualization. And he actually rather to have everything automated because he thinks too much humans are too wishy-washy. So we had a very interesting debate. We kind of settled in the middle, so both probably needed. But he pushed really, really bad. And then we started tried to do science, take the science tradition, and he's like, no, that's old science, we want new science. So I think you need uh, multiple angles. That's really kind of the, also the stability philosophical principle that life is just very complicated. You need to see things from multiple angles. And if they agree, I'm happier. And if they don't agree, you have to make your bet. Uh, I think we're out of time now, so let's uh, thank Dean again. Thank you. Now, thank our break. We'll be continuing.